Um, today we're going to continue uh, with our discussion of this antibody diversity problem. Um, I gave you the big picture answer of how we solved the antibody diversity problem last time. I told you that we got this huge number of antibodies based first on um, combinatorial diversity. So we pair together different heavy chains and different light chains, and that allows us to use fewer genes to make a bunch of antibodies. And then we also pair together mini gene segments, named V, D, and J, in order to um, also get lots of antibodies off of a small number of gene segments. <coughs> and then as I mentioned to you last time, we also have this additional process of junctional diversity, where when we paste things back together, we don't paste them perfectly. That further gives us the um, diversity that we see in the antibody numbers. And so largely what we're going to be seeing is this process where each B cell as it's developing is going to choose um, one B segment, one J segment, um, and put them together to make a diversity of receptors. And as that process is happening, the intervening DNA is going to be cut out um, and uh, sort of thrown away. Um, one thing that I want to point out about this is that we've actually kind of mentioned this already, but not as maybe as clearly. Um, so you've seen this table before. And in fact, if you hear about the immune system in a lot of different places, you often see this table, this sort of table of what are the key features of innate and adaptive immunities, often talked about at the beginning of immunology. And there's always this one sentence on there about how the innate immune response diversity is a limited number of conserved germline encoded receptors. That just means they're normal proteins that are encoded by normal genes. And the adaptive immune response is highly diverse, a large number of receptors arising from recombination of receptor genes in each individual. So VDJ recombination is actually one of the defining features that makes a cell an adaptive immune cell. Um, and Oftentimes, they try to say that without saying that in these uh, types of tables because you haven't learned VDJ recombination yet, but that's really what this table is trying to tell you. Um, this will also come back a little bit at the end today to be important, um, but this process of VDJ recombination is actually found in all jawed vertebrates. Um, and so when we think about kind of the evolution of the immune system, um, interesting aspects of the immune system were kind of starting to develop in a number of different organisms. Um, at this point right here, about 500 million years ago, 550 million years ago, which is when the blue organisms or the jawed vertebrates started to arise, all of a sudden, snap, those organisms have an adaptive immune system and nobody, uh, nobody before them. And so sometimes it's referred to as the immunological Big Bang, where as you can see, suddenly we've got T cell receptors, B cell receptors, like this whole big, basically everything we know of as the adaptive immune system starting in the jaw vertebrates. There's something kind of similar that has really recently been found in um, fish that don't have jaws, so lampreys and highfish, but really from jaw vertebrates on to uh, other, any other type of organism um, we do see this adaptive immunity process, we see VDJ recombination, uh, and it's really interesting in an evolutionary sense because it does look like it just sort of bang came in. And we can actually talk a little bit about that um, later on today. Yeah? So there's not, um, so in all other groups of invertebrates, there's no difference? There's no adaptive immunity, there's only innate immunity. Um, but we also discussed last time that there is this problem with VDJ recombination. If you make a list of all the different tissues in the body and how frequently there are cancers of that tissue, you'll end up, you see skin as number one. Like skin cancer is the most common. And you're like, well, duh, because like people sit out in the sun. So your skin is really in contact with UV light and with carcinogens. And if you were to keep going down that list, you basically see all of the, the big tissues that have lots of cancers are the ones that are in contact with the outside world. The ones that can get 
mutated by some sort of environmental mutism. Except you will find the immune system pretty high. You'll, it's way higher than it ought to be. And the reason for that is because your B cells and T cells as they develop are in fact cutting, breaking their DNA. And so sometimes this process goes wrong. Sometimes you have the example, like the Philadelphia chromosome shown on the right, where um, while we are seeing recombination, um, the uh, piece that's cut off actually joins back onto the wrong chromosome instead of joining onto the right one. You can see things like that. That leads, in this case, to uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. But in fact, many of the different sort of lymphomas and leukemias are distinguished based on which stage of development the B cell or T cell is at when um, it encounters a problem. Um, and so there are so many types of B cell and T cell cancers, more than you might expect, and it's all because of this. And so this is a very dangerous process. Sometimes when I start talking about BDJ recombination, students are like, excuse me, there's active mutation. The cells mutate on purpose. The cells break their DNA on purpose. And yeah, that's what's going on here. Um, and that is sort of counterintuitive to a lot of what you thought about. And so what you should realize is that this is really, really, really risky and is going to need to be regulated in a whole lot of ways because there is such dramatic risk from this process. Yep? So if there are 10 to the 16 different common genes, mm -hmm. does that mean there are also 10 to the 16 different types of cancers that can come from it? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> the, um, We can have a conversation about the philosophical parts behind my answer later. Because <laughs> there's there are different ways I could address that I could answer that question. And they go long directions in different directions. Um, and so as a result, today we're going to start going through the specific details of VDJ recombination. We're going to be seeing a lot of proteins that are involved and their actions and how they work. Um, and the reason why we're going to have to really pay so much attention to all of these proteins and what they're doing and sort of all of these specific details is that this is really a big part of how we regulate this process that can be so dangerous. Um, so at some point today, I will mention quite a bit about uh, RAG1 and 2. I will mention TDT. Um, I'm going to talk about Artemis. I'm going to I will probably mention KU uh, DNA PK like super briefly, and just say like, they are a thing. I will mention there's a ligase. Officially, it's ligase 4. It's just going to be a ligase. <laughs> um, I'm not really going to mention too much about some of these other um, specific proteins, but many of these are the proteins that you are going to see today. Um, and so we are going through today this process of VDJ recombination in detail. <laughs> And so we've got to think a little bit about this process, and I want you to think about it as a dangerous process, where what we are trying to do is take this V1, this J2, put them next to each other, um, cut out the intervening DNA. And so if you are going to cut and paste DNA at specific sites, what types of things would you need to make that happen? <laughs> You need a nuclease. You need something to do the cutting. And so we're going to have at some point have to find out what does the cutting. What else do you need? Ligase. You're going to need a ligase to stick things back together. And so in this process, we're going to see a ligase that sticks things back together. What else might be really important to think about? Yes, Tony. Like some sort of chaperone protein that would make sure that, like, once the, I don't know if chaperone protein is the right word, but like protective proteins could, like, tap ends of stuff that could, like, attack somewhere else. So, like so we're going to have to think about, you know, proteins that are protecting um, things that are going on and making sure that they're, we don't have stuff messed up. Yeah, Lexi. Binding proteins. Okay, we're going to have a, a lot of binding proteins. Um, yeah? Proteins to move the DNA from place to place. Maybe proteins to move the DNA from place to place. There's also <laughs> one really important thing that we're going to need. There is going to need to be something special about the DNA that says cut here. Because you don't want all of these nucleases cutting any old place. There needs to be some kind of marker that says this is the cutting place. Cutting in other places is bad. You want to cut here. 
And so the first thing that we need to talk about is how is it that these B and J segments are marked or distinguished so that all of these enzymes will actually cut there instead of cutting any old <coughs> random piece of DNA. Um, this is due to some unique DNA sequences. So the DNA in these regions is unique. Um, the DNA in these regions is um, called the recombination signal sequence, or the RSS. What you can notice is that there is a B segment right here. And it's right next to the B <coughs> segment, there is this area of sequence, which is known as the RSS. Here is a J segment. Right next to the J segment is an RS, is also an RSS. Um, oftentimes when we draw them, when we don't draw out the whole sequence, we end up drawing them as little triangles. And notice that the triangles here are shown in two different colors. So if I was gonna draw some information about some of these segments, I might draw it looking like this. pieces of DNA that are adjacent to each other. This is the V segment, and then that's the RSS. And they are two different kinds of RSS, which usually I draw one that is shaded and one that's not. So this is how I might draw it. I also drew the constant region later on. Um, those triangles actually include three different parts of the sequence. One of those parts of the sequence is known as the heptamer. It's a seven base pair segment that's always the same. So the heptamer is always C-A-C-A-G-T-G, uh, always. Um, and so you can see there's the heptamer right next to the V segment here. You can see there's a heptamer right next to the J segment here. Then there is a spacer. The spacer is a random sequence. It's the sequence of the spacer doesn't matter, but the length of the spacer does matter. There are two kinds of spacers. One kind is 23 base pairs long. The other kind is 12 base pairs long. And then after the spacer, there is another conserved sequence. This time it's nine base pairs long and it's known as, it's known as the nonomer. Um, and that's always A C A A A A A C C. Always. And so whenever we draw one of these RSS triangles, mm -hmm. that's actually what is being encompassed. And you can see that they're drawn as two different colors. That is indicating that one of them has a 23 base pair spacer and one of them has a 12 base pair spacer. And noting the difference between the 23 and the 12 and sort of knowing where they are is going to be quite important. Um, so I want you to think about the numbers 12 and 23 for a second. Just as you think about those two numbers as numbers, or like in kindergarten, or in half kindergarten, or in elementary school now. What do you know about the numbers 12 and 23? Hmm? 23 is almost double 12. Mm -hmm. It turns out that what we now know is that 12 base pairs is one turn around the DNA helix. And 23 is two turns around the DNA helix. And so the idea is here, the heptamer and nonomer are separated by two turns. So that's why the sequence doesn't matter, it's the spacing. Here, the heptamer and nonomer are separated by one turn of the helix. 
So there are times where these are called two turn and one turn phasers. I've pretty much always been called them 12 and 23. But that's actually why 12 and 23 is what, what that matters for. Um, all right. And so these sequences are what actually sort of mark, they're right next to the Vs, the Js, or the Ds in order to say this is where we should cut the DNA because we don't want to cut any old place. Mark, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. I did, but not anymore because I can't. Okay, excellent. So one of the big reasons why you care about this whole process and these RSSs is that in VDJ recombination, there is a rule. The rule is called the 1223 rule. And the 1223 rule means that you can only put together a DNA segment with a 12 with a DNA segment with a 23. So a 12 can't go with a 12, a 23 can't go with a 23. You have to put a 12 together with a 23. That's how the enzymes are going to work. Happily, when we look at the kappa light chain, there are 12s on the V and there are 23s on the J. So these can go with Js very easily. Js cannot go with Js. These cannot go with these. But these can go with Js. So we're good. In the case of the lambda light chain, the Vs have 23s, the Js have 12s. Um, really what's important about the light chain is that the Vs and Js are different. So they can combine with each other. You don't go VV, you don't go JJ, you always go VJ. In the heavy chain, and this is specifically in the heavy chain of B cells, Vs have a 23, Js have a 23, and Ds have 12 on either side. And so you can put a D together with a J, you can put a D together with a V, you can't put a D with another D, because they don't have matching ones. You can't put together V and J and skip D. You can only put together a, a V, a D, and a J. Um, and so uh, you can see the 1223 rule again here. Um, here we're looking at a light chain at the top. You've got a V and a J. You can see that the V, in this case, the V cell has chosen V3 and J3 and put the two of them together. Um, the RSS is gone. The two of them are actually fused together. So if I was going to draw that, I would make sure I drew my two boxes touching each other with nothing in between them. And you can also see that the stuff on the outside, the stuff towards the 5' prime or the 3' prime, is still there. So you can see V1 and 2 are still sitting there with their RSS. You can see J4 is still sitting there with its RSS. The constant region is still sitting there. Um, and in the case of the heavy chain, we will end up uh, combining a D and a J, and then we'll combine that V with that EJ. And that is something that we're going to talk a bit more about next week. So like, if you can't remember that fact right now, that's okay. We're gonna, that comes up more later. Yeah, Mark. So like, does the order first EJ, then D? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, typically, in every example I'm showing you here, and in honestly, pretty much every example I ever show you, you're going to see something that looks like what you see here. And the way that this process works involves the region between the recombination <laughs> signal sequences getting deleted. So here you can see um, the recombination signal sequence that's bound to V1, you can see one bound to V2, you can see one bound to J. We can put together V1 and J. Everything on the outside towards the 5' prime and 3' prime regions is intact, nothing changes. Everything in between, including the RSS, is deleted. One thing that you might notice on my drawing and in all of the examples I have shown you thus far, is that the triangles, the two different types of triangles, the 12 and the 23, are pointing towards each other. So you can see that on my drawing over here, 
they're <coughs> pointing in. The B's are the B ones are pointing towards the J, the J ones are pointing towards the Z. And that has been true on every slide I've shown you thus far. It actually doesn't have to be true. You can have a J. Or a, B, or a B, or whatever, with the RSS on the wrong side, <coughs> pointing in the other direction. When that happens, you don't see what is shown on this slide. The region in between here is not deleted. When that happens, we see something different occur. So, sorry, here you can see, see this, this triangle is pointing to the right, and that one's pointing to the right. I know my, that was pointing to the left and that one's pointing to the right. I totally know my left and right. They're pointing in towards each other. If they're pointing in the same direction, as you can see here, where they're both pointing to the left, the DNA in the middle actually gets flipped over. And so you can see that originally we had GPT upside down. And we can do, uh, if we do the recombination in this case, it gets flipped over. This is called inversional joining. So inversional joining is a thing, it does happen. You may in your textbook see situations where the RSS <laughs> seems to be pointing in the wrong way, and it's true and it totally happens. Sometimes people do experiments where they make inversional joining happen and do some cool tricks. You may see it in a paper. I am generally not gonna be talking about it. If, if you see, if we're doing some problem, don't like assume inversional joining. I want you to know that it exists because you might come across it in looking at your book or looking at paper, so like it is a thing. But it's not something I'm ever gonna assume that we're doing. Um, so the first thing that we need, as we pointed out, is some mark on the DNA in order to say this is the DNA that we want to cut. And that is the recombination signal sequence or RSS. What else do we need to make this process happen? You guys already said it. Yeah. A nuclease. Um, and so the next part of this is where we get the nuclease coming in. Um, there are two proteins here that are working together. These two proteins are known as RAG1 and RAG2. The recombinase activating gene 1 and the recombinase activating gene 2. They usually work together. A lot of times you see it written as RAG1, 2 because they work so closely together. Um, if I am being perfectly official, RAG1 binds the RSS and RAG2 makes the cut. It's actually what happens, but they work together, they're binding really close together. And so they are both recognizing and they're making the cut. But there's a key thing we have to know about this cut. We're going to see this in detail in a couple of slides later, so I'm going to explain it through on this one and on the next one. And if you totally don't get it, it's going to come up again on a couple other slides to explain, be explained in a different way. Okay? So it's not any old kind of cut that is made here. In fact, it is a special kind of cut called a nuclease. <laughs> um, so RAG2 makes what's called a DNA NIC. And a NIC in DNA means that one side of the double strand is cut, but not the other. So we've got double stranded DNA, but we are only seeing a single stranded cut. And you can see that RAG2 makes that single stranded cut right at the border between the RSS and the V or D or J, whatever segment we're talking about here, our mini input. So the thing that's gonna happen is RAG2 is making that DNA NIC. And so now we've got one piece of DNA that's broken and one piece of DNA that is not. And so let's think about this for a second in sort of a, um, little bit more biochemy way. So we've broken the DNA. On this side, 
we have a place where we've got a phosphate and a hydroxyl and a phosphate and a hydroxyl, you know, all making it along the background, right? Here, we have our hydroxyl that's free and we have our phosphate that's free because we just broke the DNA. They're not put together anymore like they are on the other strand. So that's what we got at the end of this step. Please work. Um, and you can see that exact thing here. We have one strand that's intact. We have one strand that has this free three prime hydroxyl and this free phosphate. And that three prime hydroxyl is the very last base pair of the main gene of the V or the D or the J. This phosphate is the very beginning of the heptamine. Well, see, now you have a random free three prime hydroxyl. These hydroxyls do not feel, do not enjoy being random and free. And so this three prime hydroxyl is going to perform a nucleophilic attack. This is like the most chemistry I'm gonna do for a long time. <laughs> There's a nucleophilic attack. That three prime hydroxyl is going to attack the phosphate across from it on the other strand. And so in the end, this hydroxyl is going to attack this phosphate, and we are going to see one part where the top strand like connects back to the bottom strand, because the top strand has attacked the bottom strand. So we get this weird loop, this hairpin. We also get this end that has a free uh, phosphate and a free hydroxyl. This loopy one is the one that is the V or the D or the J. That's the main gene. It codes for the antibody in the end. We're going to keep using that one. It's, it's going to be part of the thing that codes for the antibody. And so oftentimes we call that the coding end. I've also heard it referred to as the coding joint, or for reasons I don't understand, I would always call it the coding join, but the word has a T on the end. <laughs> so if I say the coding join and I, it looks like it says joint, that's just how I learned it. Sorry. The other part has the RSS. And the, the last S is the signal, or the second S. One of the S is a signal. <laughs> and so we call that the signal end. Also, sometimes the signal joint or the signal joint. And so now we've got two pieces of DNA. We've got a coding end, and we've got a um, signal end. First, and so now we actually have to think about what is happening um, to the coding end. and we we need to think about what's happening to the signal end. So we've got two different kind of pathways to follow. You also need to be aware that if this is happening to, this was B2 of my earlier drawing, the same thing is happening at the same time to some J. So in fact, right now, we have a signal join from here, we have a coding join from here. We have a signal join from here. We have a coding join from here. So we actually have four DNA ends right now that have to get taken care of. Much danger. Um, the signal joint is really easy. What happens for the rest of the signal joint? Very straightforward. The fate of the signal joint. The two signal joints, this one and this one, get ligated together. The end. So those two signal joints, which were made really nicely, they have nice phosphate, nice hydroxyl. There's no weird messiness of, cur of curves or anything. They just, you just take those two DNA ends and you go whoop, and you're done. They're ligated together by ligase. The signal joint is done. Um, you, uh, if the RSSs were in opposite directions, then you make that DNA circle that you throw away. Done. No one cares anymore. Yeah, Mark. What stops them from ligating to form hairpins? What do you mean? Like, in this one, what happened was oh. OH attacked T. Why doesn't that OH attack T? Um, so, one part of this that you might sort of look at crazy as being crazy from my drawing 
is that it looks like the V and the J are way far apart as this whole process is happening. <clears throat> it turns out that RAG1 and RAG2, as well as many of the other proteins here, are working as a complex and are grabbing the DNA and holding it close together. You can see up at the top um, where, or you can also see it here, that there are a whole bunch of DNA binding proteins acting at these sites, binding to the DNA, holding them, that will shove the two signal joints together. You can also see this up here. RAG is shown as this giant blue complex, um, which is re it's really the two proteins and some of their friends as well, all working together. They are holding those two pieces of DNA together. So in reality, this DNA has been bent so that those two things are right next to each other. And because of that large group of proteins holding all the DNA ends of the complex, we don't have that attack. All right, so signal joint. Things get a little bit trickier at the coding joint. The coding joint is the one that includes the mini gene, the V or the D or the J. It's going to be part of the uh, DNA that actually codes for the antibody. And really, the reason why things get so tricky is because this is where those processes of junctional diversity come into play. So I mentioned to you guys before that when we join two mini gene segments like BK21, that's pink, and JK1, that is yellow, when we join them together, when we join those two signal joints, we can sometimes get variation in the base pairs that are coming together. And that is what gives us that extra diversity. This is junctional diversity. And so when we're trying to put them together, some extra processes are happening. When we look at the signal joints, the RSS in purple and the RSS in red, you can see they always lie together and give you exactly the same product and there's no variation and everything's just stuck together, done. But things get wonky with the coding joint. Um, and the wonkiness is actually related to something we've already talked about. It's related to the fact that we have made this DNA hairpin. So remember that to form the coding joint, B3 prime hydroxyl on one strand performs a nucleophilic attack on the other strand. So we don't have just like a normal piece of double-stranded DNA on this one. We have this weirdo hairpin where one of the strands is actually connected to the other. You can ligate the signal end that has a nice normal set of uh, ends. That's easy to ligate. But that you can't ligate that very easily. And so how you deal with this molecule becomes a bit of a problem. You have this hairpin. And the hairpin opening is the first place that we get junctional diversity. When I learned about this process as an undergrad, I learned, and then the hairpin opens. That was very funny. Um, in the time, kind of the end of when I was an undergrad, starting grad school, someone found the enzyme that did this process. Someone discovered the enzyme. So, um, and if you don't have this enzyme, then you get to this step of BDJ recombination, and you have a whole bunch of coding ends, and you can't put them together because they're still hairpins, and so your B cells don't develop and they die, and you have no B cells. And you also have no T cells. And so you might die because of infectious disease. Maybe. You're going to probably get very sick. And you're probably going to get very sick as a kid. Um, and so most of those kids who were found, most of the people who were found who had a deficiency in this enzyme were immunodeficient little kids, the really sick kids. As a result, the person who found the enzyme named it Artemis, who was a Greek god who protected because this protein protects children from <laughs> <laughs> um, And so um, the next thing that happens is Artemis is going to cut that hairpin open so that we have a product that can be ligated. 
Artemis is great. That's how you don't have immunodeficiency. But Artemis also kind of sucks. <laughs> the problem with Artemis is that Artemis does not know which bond is the bond to break. Ideally, Artemis cuts at exactly this point, exactly where that phosphate had attacked the hydroxyl. But there are a whole bunch of phosphate oxygen bonds here between each part of the backbone. And Artemis doesn't really know which one is the one it's supposed to cut. Artemis is held in place as part of that protein complex. And so it's not going to cut like any old where. Can't cut like to infinity. But it can actually cut up to five base pairs in either direction the wrong way. If Artemis is perfect, it cuts at location two. It cuts at the place where originally there was a nucleophilic attack. Then the end product is this nice, original, pretty looking DNA. Nothing is messed up. Kind of looks like it did at the beginning, the end. But Artemis can cut at position one, a little bit off, too close to the top. And then what you can see is you get some extra sequence down here and a little hole up here. You get what's called an overhang. Artemis can also cut up to five base pairs in the other direction, leading to a different overhang. Um, this is how the extra base pairs get added. Because now, these ba three base pairs or these three base pairs, those are new sequence that's not present in the germline that's been added. And I'm going to show you this on the next couple slides. So this is new added sequence. Those get just added in. And so that's one of the mechanisms of junctional diversity. Um, and so you can see Artemis is going to cleave the hairpin. We're going to get maybe a perfect uh, cleavage, maybe not a perfect cleavage. You can also see that process happening here, where perhaps you don't get a perfect cleavage. You can notice here that there was a TC. It got hairpinned around to a GA. And in this case, Artemis cut here. And so the GA ended up on the top strand, not on the bottom strand. So there's a new GA on this strand that was not present in the germline. If you notice, GA is going to be, oh, the next step, I'll do it this way. The next step is going to be that there's actually going to be a, a polymerase that fills it in. So you end up, your GA gets, well, this whole thing gets filled in. So on the top, you end up with TCGA. And on the bottom, you end up with TCGA. Those are the same. It reads same thing, forward and backward. TCGA on the top, forward. TCGA backward on the bottom. It reads the same thing forward and backward. There's a word in English that means a word that's the same forward and backward. Yes? It's a palindrome. So you've heard of the word madam on Adam, or like that phrase, but there's a whole bunch of them. Where if you write it forward and backward, it's the same thing. Yeah. These are called palindromic nucleotides, or P nucleotides. And so this is how P nucleotides get added. Let me show you this again, just in another way, possibly. Yeah. All right, here you can see I have a B region with some sequence, and the B region sequence is in black. I have a J region with some sequence. The J region sequence is in black as well. And you can see I have a 12 and a 23, and the 12 and the 23 RSS sequences are in red. They are lined up nicely by that protein complex. Ta-da. The first thing that happens is going to be that RAG2 makes a nick. It's going to make a nick here. It's going to make a nick here. We are only going to follow one of those nicks because it would get too messy on the slide if I did both of them. So we're only going to see one, but realize that we're having two happening through this process. 
So we have our nick. We, we've lost the other piece of DNA. We've got single strand break. This hydroxyl is going to attack right there. Now, the signal joint is going to be gone. We are just going to be left here with the coding joint. And let's imagine that Artemis cuts here five base pairs away. The end result is going to be that we're going to have an A, a T, an A, a T, and a G now added in. And a polymerase is going to complement them as is shown there. And so now we're going to have five new base pairs of sequence that did not exist in the original germline that have been added. So the stuff I wrote didn't exist in the original germline. And you can also see that if you look at it, it reads the same forward and backward. And so it's palindromic. And so this is the first way that junctional diversity happens. There is also a situation where there is a nuclease that can sometimes cut back sequence too. So you can also lose sequence here. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that nuclease, but, but you can also lose sequence here. Again, I don't tend to ask, I don't think I've ever asked a question on an exam where there's been a nuclease, but it does exist. They have it in the book or something. Yes, that is a thing. So we've, now we've got one of our mechanisms of junctional diversity. But there, we still have not yet actually pasted together our two coding joints. Before we paste together our two coding joints, there is one more thing that has to happen. The other thing that has to happen is that there's one more enzyme that's going to play a role. This enzyme is also a polymerase. This, and you will see it on the next slide. Uh, its name is uh, terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase, or TDT. Let's see TDT on the next. TDT, like I said, it's a polymerase, but it's a kind of different polymerase than any other DNA polymerase you've ever really learned about. So I'm going to now draw TDT's action on this sequence. It can actually be any number of base pairs. I'm going to, it's usually like a couple. I'm going to draw like a ton to be really obvious, but it's usually only like a couple. It just adds whatever it wants. As many as it wants, whatever it wants. I just wrote some random letters. And those get complemented. So, T, so as you can see, we open the hairpin. We may see the exonuclease doing some cleavage. And then TDT is going to add in random nucleotides. It's a polymerase that is non-template dependent. It doesn't need to be trying to match another strand, which is what most of the polymerases you have learned about before do. It can just add whatever it wants. And so it will add some base pairs. Because they are random base pairs, they are known as N nucleotides. N being N is sort of like for random. And so we'll get some random N nucleotides added. Um, now we will finally take our two coding joints and ligate them together with ligates once we have added in our N nucleotides. Um, and so uh, that is sort of the, the general idea. Now I want to also kind of show you one other thing. I'm going to go with this one. All right, so I'm going to show you two how should I do this? Yeah, I'm going to show you a couple different situations. And you will see similar questions to this on the problem set and on old exams and things like that. I'm doing this for a reason. All right. The V segment is G, A, G, C, A, T, A, T. The J segment is C, C, T, A, G, a, C, G, T, okay? Now, I am going to show you the sequence 
that was found in two different B cells. And both of those B cells use this J and this uh, V, but they have slightly different junctional diversity P and N nucleotides. So one B cell might be this. The other might have this sequence. This is a sequence that we found when we sequenced this region of their genome. And if you look at some of the questions I have asked in the past, I have asked students, label the origin of the nucleotides, specifically labeling P and Ns as, as correct. So I'm going to show you first the first part of answering this question, which people forget, and it gets you points to do this. origin of those ones is the V or the J. So I just circled them and said that was the V or that was the J. That's where they originated from, was from the original V or the original J. But I have these extra junctional diversity nucleotides in the middle. And so the harder part of this question is figuring out where those came from. And what I'm asking you to do on a question like this is label each of them as P or N. So the way that you do that is you actually go through them one at a time. So we start with this one, this A. Is this A a P nucleotide or an N nucleotide? And how do you know? Yes, Mark. It's a P nucleotide. It's a P nucleotide. How do you know it's a P nucleotide? Because if you like imagine it as a palindromic sequence, it works. Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. The, the way I do it is I go like this. Can a T, can this A bind to with this T? Why, yes, yes, it can. So it could have been a P nucleotide. Technically, it also can be an N, but the way I write the question is if it can be P, you must label it as P because someone got me on that. <laughs> um, all right, so then we go to the next one, the T. Is this T possibly a P or an N? So this is a P. Why is it a P? Because it combined to this A. Okay, so now let's look at this G. Is this G a P or an N? Life, life gets a little tricky now. So, first, so the first thing we've got to do is we've got to say, well, is it a P over here? So we look, does this G bind to this T? No. If, if, if you get a no, that means you're done with P's on that side. Because N's happen later, so we finished P up nucleotides on this side. Now we look on this side. So let's look at this G first. What's this G? P, because it combined to this C. And then what's this G? P, because it bound to this C. Okay? And so I would label each of these. I'd be like, P, 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 for that one. All right, now let's look at this one. What's this C? Well, the C can't bind to the T. So it can't be a P nucleotide over there. We got no P nucleotides on this side. All right, what about this T? N. N. It can't, so we don't have no, no P nucleotides there. And so in fact, we would be N, 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 N. Usually I end up with a mixture of them. I don't usually do all at the same time. But the reason why I showed you this, and the reason why I wrote this example in this way, is this G. Because if you look at it, you're like, no, the G binds to the C. It's a, it's a P nucleotide, it's not an N. 
the thing you have to realize is there's an order in when you do the P's and when you do the N's. P's are added before N's. So you can't have an N and then a P. The P's have to come first. Um, and so you can see base pairs that might confuse you, and that's why doing it in order is actually very important. And again, if you look at old exams, if you look at the problem set, if you look at practice problems, you will see things like this, and I'm happy to talk through them in office hours, but that is how you address those kinds of problems. Do you have a question mark? No. Okay. All right, so here is our overview of what happens at the coding joint. Um, so we have uh, a coding joint made. We have our two hairpins. Artemis opens those hairpins. Um, the ends are going to be processed by enzymes, including TET and then others. And then we will ligate together um, that DNA. And we might have some additional stuff added in, this little blue color that wasn't in the original with the red and the yellow. Um, so I told you before that this is a very dangerous process. Um, and so we might want to talk a little bit about how we limit recombination errors. And there are two really big ways that we limit recombination errors. One of them is that all of these proteins bind together and act as a complex and are holding on to the DNA ends. They're not going to like let go of the DNA ends and let it float around and find some other thing to, to ligate to. They're holding all of this DNA together in close proximity um, so that the most favorable reaction is that it with the DNA that's close by and not with some other far away protein. And so just working, having all of these sort of binding the DNA and having lots of DNA binding proteins there at the same time makes this reaction more favorable than other types of reactions. The other really important thing that happens with regulation is that the enzymes that do this process, RAG1 and RAG2, are very, very tightly controlled in terms of when they are transcribed and translated in the cell. The cell cells will turn on and off production of RAG because you don't want to have this nuclease hanging out in your cells all the time. If you do, that could increase the chances of bad DNA cuts happening, of bad mutations happening, of RAG cutting the wrong DNA. And so by only having the cell transcribe and translate RAG when um, it is needed and having it otherwise completely shut off is also really important for this regulation. So it turns out that during um, the life of a developing B cell, for example, the cell turns on RAG two times. One time, two times. Otherwise, before that, it's off. In the middle, it's off. Afterwards, it's off. And it's actually off for the rest of the B cell's life. It's only ever on those two times during development. The two times, spoiler alert for next week. Time number one, when it does BEJ recombination of the heavy chain. Time number two, when it does BEJ recombination of the light chain. And that's it. <laughs> no more. Um, in the life of that B cell, in between those two steps, there's actually a part where the cell undergoes a whole bunch of cell division, there's a whole bunch of mitosis, and, it's, and we definitely have RAG totally off then. There is no RAG on at all during mitosis. Because in mitosis, when you're doing the cell cycle, you're moving DNA around a lot. And that would be like the riskiest possible time to have a nuclease around. And so if whenever these cells divide, they always have RAG off because you don't want any mistakes with this nuclease potentially cutting the DNA. Yeah. What's the half-life of RAG? I don't know off the top of my head. Um, so these are the two big ways that we um, think about regulating um, this process. So I've got kind of two sets of information to tell you about. Um, I'm obviously not going to make it through both of them. Um, they're both kind of interesting and are things that will come up later if they don't do them today. Um, yeah? I was going to ask um, how long the EJ recombination takes. 
Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, so I'm going to tell you about one set of this stuff. The other stuff we'll tell you about later. Um, hopefully what I'm going to tell you now starts to address some of the places where you're making mean faces at me on Monday. <laughs> um, so first of all, I just want to tell you there are patients, I kind of implied this earlier, who cannot do VDJ recombination. So there are patients who do not have RAG1, there are patients who do not have RAG2, there are patients who do not have Artemis. Um, they end up with slightly different types of syndromes. Sometimes it's called skin, sometimes it's called Omen syndrome. So they have no T cells and no B cells because of this failure of VDJ recombination. And in both cases, they have extreme susceptibility to all sorts of infections. You may have heard of boy in a bubble syndrome. This is boy in a bubble syndrome. This is where you have to live in complete absence of pathogens because you cannot perform VDJ recombination. Um, so uh, this, there are absolutely patients who cannot do this process. Um, so the kind of last bit of stuff, and again, I am telling you this largely because I want you to know it happens and it exists and to calm down some of the questions you had from last, from earlier this week. Um, all of this stuff that I'm going to tell you now will come back later in more detail, but right now it's just a, this is a thing. So first of all, I wanted to remind you that our, this whole process of VDJ recombination and antibody production is happening in a B cell. And I have mentioned to you that this process forms both antibodies and B cell receptors because our B cell has a B cell receptor that looks just like an antibody except that it has a transmembrane domain. And so you might wonder, well, how does the B cell make both of those things? What's up with that? The answer is that uh, downstream of the constant region, there are two different uh, splice sites. One that um, results in a version of the protein with a transmembrane domain, one that doesn't. And so basically, it's just a question of whether or not the B cell is going to splice that RNA in order to make a version of this protein with a transmembrane domain or one without. One thing that's sort of interesting to note here is that this process is happening at the RNA level. We're changing RNA here by splicing. We're not changing DNA. And so this B cell could make both kinds of RNA at the same time and could do both of these things. RNA changes are reversible. DNA changes, like VDJ recombination, are not reversible. So splicing is the answer to how you can make BCRs and antibodies. Of course, the thing that you really did not like was you didn't like it when I started talking about isotypes. Um, so I told you that there were, I'll come back to this in a second, Situations where you can have the same variable region with different constant regions. So you can have that variable region as an IgM, or you can have it class switched or isotype switched to an IgG. Um, this is related to the um, setup of the immunoglobulin loci on the gene. So we have been talking about the V and J regions of the light chain or the V, D, and J regions of the heavy chain. But in fact, if you go further to five prime to this, there are different parts that encode the heavy chain. In the case of the light chain, you just, or sorry, that encode the constant region. In the case of the light chain, you just make the constant region. There aren't choices. <laughs> With the heavy chain, you've got choices for all of the different uh, isotypes. Um, and so if we have use, if we um, use the mu constant region, we'll end up making IgM. If we have use delta, we'll make IgD. I mentioned to you before about this great distance between some of them. Particularly, you can see there's this huge distance between D and G. Um, it turns out that the cell is actually able to make a transcript that includes both M and B uh, constant region. That is like an okay amount of DNA to be transcribed all at once. And the cell can then use alternative splicing to make one that has mu and to make one that has delta. And so you can make IgM or IgD based on alternative splicing of the same RNA product. Um, and just make your two different antibodies with two different constant regions. See here, the uh, cell kept the mu parts and did splicing 
and didn't keep the D parts. Here, there was splicing, so that it kept the D parts and got rid of the M parts in making that final uh, RNA product. If we wanted to make some of the other isotypes, we wanted to make G or E or A, they're way far away. It's too long to make a full transcript. And so, in fact, you have to have another recombination event, another DNA break, another cut and paste, where you throw out the M and the D, and you put the G, or you put the E, or you put the A close. So now you can transcribe those. This is another process called class switch recombination. It uses totally other enzymes, not the ones we just talked about. And it's something that we talk about later. But for those of you who were like really uncomfortable about its existence, this is how it happens. Similarly, you did not like the fact that I told you that the affinity of an antibody matures throughout the course of a response. So throughout the course of a response, we'll go from somewhat weak binding to much stronger binding. Again, this is, uh, this is officially known as affinity maturation because the affinity gets better. Um, the way that that happens is there's also another mutation process where there's a mutator enzyme that specifically mutates the VDJ region in order to allow for changes in amino acids and better binding. So you can see there are a whole bunch of mutations. Basically, this mutator protein is mutating the CDR regions in order to allow for tighter binding. Um, the most critical part of this whole business is that somatic hypermutation, aka affinity maturation, where we get tighter binding, and class switch, where we switch to G's and E's and A's, happen late in the life of a B cell, late in the response. They involve the B cell interacting with the T cell. And so I cannot tell you any more about them until after we talk about T cells. Um, and so that's why I'm not going anywhere further with that, but that's the answer to some of the questions y'all were asking. 